proven by the motto that every individual on this planet deserves quality care. Oxen Group works passionately to help others live fearlessly. Our footprints have expanded to over 70 plus countries where patients, doctors and partners alike rely on Oxen Group to move forward. Every orthopedic implant manufactured by us meets the highest quality standards, not resting on our laurels. We are constantly improving our processes and technology. Internationally sourced, all our raw materials is from top-notch quality providers. A remarkable journey that began almost a quarter of a century ago with the hip replacement implant. The Austin Moore prosthesis has diversified into implants for trauma, kneeling, spinal, maxillofacial and veterinary care along with the selection of ancillary general instruments used in related surgical procedures. Reminiscent of a sci-fi film set, our clean room is a medical marvel. Not only is our clean room designed as per ISO 14644-1 norms under category class 5, 7 and class 8, it offers possibilities for adapting to special requirements too. Our pursuit of excellence has resulted in Oxen Group becoming India's first orthopedic implant manufacturing company to receive the prestigious and most coveted MDSAP or Medical Device Single Audit Program Certification. In order to evaluate the mechanical properties of our products, we have established an in-house mechanical testing lab. Our extensive mechanical testing expertise covers static, fatigue, torsoin and wear testing of our products. We have opened offices in Germany, USA, Mexico and many more are in the pipeline to ensure best service and quality to customer in every continent globally. Dias, Division of Oxen Institute of Surgeons Academy's mission is to improve a patient's life through innovative orthopedic research and development. The Dias Academy pays special attention to the education and training of various stakeholders involved, namely customers, technicians and surgeons. Not only are we proud of being an Indian company delivering excellence, but we continue to evolve our technology and serve the best patient care with an Indian heart. Oxen. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a privilege and a pleasure on behalf of our train group to welcome all of you today. Thanks to you for being here with us. We are blessed to have you with us to participate in the third webinar organized by DAIS, the Division of Atsain Institute for Surgeon, part of Atsain Group. As all you know, Atsain Group has a division that is in charge with educating our surgeons. Last year, this division was inaugurated here in the city of Miami in a Cadaveri lab. The purpose of this webinar is to strengthen the technical requirement of our clients and train our physicians with the knowledge, skills, and confidence. Before we begin, I would like to express our sincere thanks to all of you who has been generously helped us to make this event succeed. We will also like to express our special appreciation to the team of panelists led by Dr. Sind and a specialty to Dr. Sind as our moderator. Dr. Sind is a consultant orthopedic specialized in shoulder and arthroscopy surgeries at St. Permanent Hospital in Delhi. He will be talking today about anterior shoulder and stability assessment. Dr. Yoshi is professor and senior especially at orthopedic surgery and sport medicine on Bardaman Mahavir Medical College in Safdarjan Hospital in Delhi. His topic today will be arthroscopy, van car repair, tips and perks. Dr. Shiva staff 
is an orthosurgeon senior consultant an arthroscopy and a more sport medicine specialty at San Permanent Hospital in Delhi. And he will be speaking about humeral bone defect in shoulder instability management. Dr. Babulkar is the head of the Department of Shoulder and Sport Injury at Dean and at Mangeskar Hospital in Pune, India. Founder President of Shoulder and Elbow Society, India. Head of Department and Director of FNB Sport Medicine Training Program. And he will be speaking about glenoid bony defect management principle and technique. Dr. Kumar is a consultant orthopedic surgeon at Woodin Hospital and Aberdeen Royal in Farming. And he will be exposing today revision shoulder, revision surgery in shoulder instability issues and challenges. Dr. Zin, you take control of this webinar right now. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, <clears throat> along with all the panelists, welcome you all to this webinar on anterior shoulder instability. I'll just share my screen first. So uh, my topic is pre-operative assessment of the anterior shoulder instability. As you all know, uh, it has uh, the anterior shoulder instability basically has two essential lesions, the Bankart's and the Hilsacks. And Bankart's lesion is the evolution of uh, capsule or labral complex from the anterior inferior portion of glenoid. And Hilsacks defect is caused by the dislocation when the posterior part of the head is lying against the anterior rim of the glenoid. So it causes a compression fracture there. So to address this, we have different options of uh, doing an arthroscopic bank card repair, which restores the anatomy by doing a capsulolabral restoration and as well as uh, capsular retentioning. And another procedure is latter J, where we are using the bone augmentation procedure. We can also add remplissage to a repair to augment this repair. So in the last two decades, arthroscopic bank card repair has been very popular surgery among arthroscopy surgeons and orthopedic surgeons. And everyone wants to just sort of uh, do this surgery for all instability surgeries. But the results in literature are presenting differently by different authors. Uh, Adams in his meta-analysis came out uh, by studying uh, 12 studies of arthroscopic back art repair. And they found that there's a recurrence rate of 13.7% on an average, ranging from seven to 20%. And if you consider the athletic shoulders, this recurrence rate even goes up to 20% and more. So this study found that younger age at operation and pre-operative glenoid defect, these are the factors which significantly influence the recurrent instability. So why do arthroscopic bank art repair fail? Pascal Bolo in his uh, study in 2006 identified these risk factors of failure. And he found that if the age of the patient is less than 20 years at the index surgery, the recurrence risk of failure was 31% after a uh, bank art repair. If the level of sports participation is competitive, the risk of failure is 50% and 33% in contact and overhead sports and 19% in hyperlax patients. And if you can see Hilsacks lesion and glenoid bone loss in AP view on an X-ray, the risk of failure of arthroscopic bank art ranges from 30 to 40%. So he used all these risk factors and quantified them by giving points and came out with this instability severity index score and suggested that if the score is more than six and you proceed with arthroscopic bank art repair, there's a 70% chance of failure. This score has been validated by different authors, including Lopini, uh, who came out with similar results, uh, similar to the Pascal Bolo study, and suggested that if the bank art repair is limited to patients with less than three score, there is significantly less risk of recurrence. But some others have uh, challenged this 
validity of instability in the score particularly the radiographic domains uh, they say that just the mere presence of glenoid bone loss and hill sac lesion on an x ray cannot be taken as significant if you see them you have to quantify them using ct or mri to make uh, a decision of significance of the lesions so most authors would agree that failure to recognize bony defect is the main cause of failure so preventure in his study in 2010 uh, suggested that we can have a fair bit of idea about uh, glenoid bone loss from history and examination so in history if the if there is a high energy mechanism of injury or if the arm is abducted more than 70 degrees and extended more than 30 degrees at the time of dislocation uh, if most of the instability is in the mid range of abduction if there is progressive ease of instability and if there is a prolonged history of instability these all things in history would suggest that this patient may have significant glenoid bone loss and also on examination if you see apprehension is positive in the mid range of abduction with lesser amounts of external rotation this would also suggest that this patient may have significant glenoid bone loss and when from your clinical examination and history you have a suspicion then you have to evaluate it both on the glenoid and humeral head side we will do it one by one while assessing the glenoid uh you can do it by x rays ct 3d ct mri and arthroscopy however in case view of the glenoid on a 3d ct is a benchmark which is accepted by most for best quantification of the glenoid bone loss and while you are quantifying the glenoid bone loss there are main two issues how to estimate the original glenoid shape and how to express the defect size so best shape of the original glenoid can be found out by using the best fit circle of the inferior two thirds of the glenoid and also you can use the contralateral shoulder as your reference and the defect size can be measured by using a area measurement or a linear measurement although linear measurement is easier to do because it does not require any special software so different authors have suggested different methods for quantifying the glenoid bone loss we'll see a few of these uh first is the surface area method where we just use the in face view of the glenoid and draw a best fit circle over the inferior two thirds of the glenoid and digitally calculate the surface area of the glenoid and the osseous fragment to calculate the percentage of bone loss another area method is the pico method where we take the normal shoulder as a reference and draw a best fit circle and get the surface area of the normal shoulder by using multiplanar reconstruction software and then you just superimpose this circle on the defected glenoid and calculate the amount of bone loss easier method to do is bare spot method where on a ct only you identify the bare spot and <clears throat> measure the distance from the bare spot to the posterior glenoid rim and the anterior glenoid rim and take the difference and divide by 2 and get the percentage of the glenoid bone loss so once you have found the percentage of glenoid bone loss then next thing to decide is what percentage of glenoid bone loss will be critical for you burkhart and debier in 2000 identified if there is a inverted pear shaped glenoid it's a significant bone loss for the glenoid and they suggested bony augmentation in these lo et al also in 2004 uh, had a similar finding that if there is a more than 25% glenoid bone loss it would appear as a inverted pear shaped bolo in 2006 also identified that glenoid bone loss of more than 25% is predictive of 75% of failure after arthroscopy with bank card so this 20 to 25% of glenoid bone loss has been generally accepted figure by most authors now coming on to hill sacs lesion this is present in 84 to 93% of shoulders with recurrent dislocations and this lesion is mainly related to end range instability as compared to the glenoid which causes mid range instability so for risk ass assessment of the hill sac defect there are two methods one is dynamic method which you do in trop after you have done the bank card repair and you find that <coughs> uh, by moving your shoulder through end range of motion you find whether the hill sac is engaging or non engaging although this would not be ideal since you are putting your repair to a great degree of stress by doing this test and the other method is glenoid track concept 
which you can use pre operatively to find which lesions are significant and which are not so this glenoid track uh, concept is based on the principle of bipolar bone loss and it not only gives you an idea about glenohumeral bone loss but it also helps you in deciding the treatment option for this so this is basically done by uh, if you see the figure a it's a normal glenoid n phase view and you take the 83% of the glenoid width as the glenoid track and in the figure c if the glenoid is deficient then this track is also reduced because you have to reduce the amount of deficiency from the track and if you superimpose this track on the humeral head so this straight line on the gt in figure b is the cuff attachment line and circular dotted line is the hill sack defect if your hill sack defect is found lying between the within the glenoid track line this is an on track lesion and if your hill sack defect the medial border of the hill sack defect goes out of the glenoid track line it's a off track lesion so this uh, yamamoto and etoy they did a study based on this track uh, concept and they used the surgical options based on this concept only and they found that the recurrence rate was reduced to 4.3% in their study this was further validated by different authors joel locker in arthroscopy journal in 2016 ret retrospectively analyzed 100 patients of arthroscopic bank card and found that the recurrence rate was 6% in on track lesions and 33% in off track lesions another validation of the glenoid track by james shah in his study of 57 shoulders treated by arthroscopic bankart and he found less than 8% recurrence in on track lesions and 75% recurrence rate in off track lesions this study su suggested that the positive predictive value of an off track measurement was 75% compared with 44% for the glenoid bone loss for more than 20% once you have done the pre op assessment and you have decided that you are going to go for an arthroscopic bankart you can do the final assessment while doing arthroscopy and assess all the soft tissue quality and glenoid and bony defects on the humeral head side and even then sometimes you are in for a surprise that you find that the soft tissue quality is not good for repair and you have to change your mind so in his uh, review white at all in uh, journal of american academy of orthopedic surgery in 2019 gave out this algorithm approach for choosing the right procedure for these patients of anterior shoulder instability so in his view if the glenoid bone loss is less than 25% with a small hill sacs which is on track you can safely go ahead with arthroscopic bank cut repair and if your glenoid bone loss is less than 25% with a large hill sacs which is off track you can go with arthroscopic bank cut but you have to add a remplissage procedure to it and if your glenoid bone loss is more than 25% or you have poor soft tissue or failed bank cut you should consider lateral in these patients so to conclude bony defect is the main cause of failure clinical and radiological assessment is the key to recognize the bony defect the track concept gives you idea of both humeral and glenoid defects and right procedure should be selected according to the patient profile and pre op assessment thank you so i i basically uh, was focusing more on assessment of uh, bony deficiency rather than soft tissue because i think this was identified as a more common cause of failure so next uh, Hello. talking dr arjavan yes sir so what's your preferred investigation for a patient with shoulder instability so starting investigation would always always be like an x ray of ap and uh, axillary view of a shoulder uh, and every person of uh, mine would get a mri as well uh, of the shoulder ct ideally should be done in all cases as this is the best tool to investigate the bone loss but uh, i reserve it for patients in which i suspect uh bone loss based on my clinical findings and mri
but if suppose a patient comes with multiple dislocations and with uh, examination and history or suspecting bone loss still you will go for mri yes yes mri is the first investigation in my uh, view because it will not only give you the soft tissue uh, structures which are injured but it will also give you details about the additional injuries you may find flap lesions posterior labral lesions or cuff lesions which you will miss if you don't do an mri okay arjoban if uh, there is a borderline bone loss of say 15% and the mri is uh, notorious for under diagnosing this there is a chance that you can get caught out on the table and uh, go in and find that the mri did not reveal in this case have you faced that situation yes that's what i said that the final assessment has to be on arthroscopy only sometimes you have to change your procedure at the final step only but most of the decision making should be pre op in case of shoulder instability because we have good tool of investigations available with us to correctly assess the defects okay can i ask dr kapil kumar uh, what's your opinion what will be your sequence of investigation thanks shaker so for me the first thing they all get an x-ray but if they had a radiologically documented dislocation which confirms in a, a traumatic dislocation and then relocation views i may not choose to repeat more x rays for me i need to get information both about the soft tissues and uh, and the bone defect because if we know that work from mike robinson in edinburgh has shown that up to about 33% of people after first dislocation have got some degree of bone loss so for me that is very important to quantify that because i'm sure harjoban stock and others you and ashish are going to talk about that as well the one of the biggest causes of failure of instability surgery apart from poor surgical technique i'm sure deepak will tell us about that is is failure to recognize an, un, uh, an underlying bone defect so for me my standard practice is all my patients get an mr arthrogram and a ct scan if i had to choose one investigation and if i've got a radiologically documented dislocation then i would do just a ct and not an mr arthrogram but for me all my patients get mr arthrograms uh, and that allows me to look at any unrecognized or extent of the labral lesions cuff pathology how would you be the devil's advocate you've got a radiologically documented dislocation what determines what procedure you're going to do is determined by the bone defect but you still need to know the soft tissues so my investigations are the mr arthrogram and a ct scan okay but as as ashish told that uh, in a borderline case the mri may not detect the bone loss but if it's a significant bone defect then uh, you can pick it up even on mri isn't it yeah but i do mr arthrogram and ct scan you know we have learned from over the years with all the new uh, evidence coming with unrecognized bone defects i think it was a 2018 paper from john tokish's group which have now recognized that it's about 17% bone loss is on the glenoid is the critical bit above which you got a high failure rate so we are constantly evolving the it is the key is to determine the bipolar bone loss and what i have found is that the uh, you know the 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 mr arthrograms do not pick up the bone loss because if you've got minor bone loss on both sides then if you look at the paradigm and you are then coming to uh, maybe doing something bony rather than relying on soft tissue procedures so i would do both both mr arthrogram and a ct scan deepak in your center you yeah. do a lot of arthroscopic bank card okay yeah and so you so yours is also a government institution where uh, i think there is no constraint on doing investigations so you also go for ct scan in every case or what's your yeah product? if i if i need to do one investigation multiple dislocations recurrent dislocation anyway i am going to go for surgery in this so one investigation then it's a 3d ct scan but i would always like to do an mri to rule out any other soft tissue lesions that uh, may be missed may have been that that i would be aware of when i go for uh, any intra articular uh, procedures but definitely if i 3d ct scan generally we done in 
most of the cases of recurrent dislocation, multiple dislocations. So we do quantify on CT scans. And what what is your approach, Kabulkar sir? So you have to un unmute, unmute. My approach is, uh, I try not to rely on the radiologist. Having said that, uh, most of you are aware we are served by one of the best radiology teams across our practice. Uh, but it's as a as a surgeon, I need to be confident what I'm doing, and so. I think the connection is lost. Mm. Anyway, what Harjogan said, I think the intra-articular, definitely we have to go with a broad mind. We cannot go with a prefix mind. We are, we are aware that this is the bone loss and this is the tissues. So we do explain the patient. We may have to switch from one procedure to other depending on what we see. Emma, I will tell you. But it is that borderline case where you're not sure whether the bank card or letter. If you are in doubt, if you have only one investigation, then the CT can't go wrong because the labrum tear is there, you're going to see it. In case there's a slap, your scope is there, you're going to repair that anyway. But the the repercussions of missing a bone loss are huge. That's our that's our way to look at it. Okay. Then so, uh, <laughs> we can we can proceed with the next talk then. Uh, yeah, but there's a question, and, Hajo. Yes, so there's a I question. Think, I'm answering that in the text. I think probably I should answer that question. It's about selective advantages of MR arthrogram over an MRI scan. I can send it by text or I can just answer that question if there is time. Yeah, we can send it. Yes, sir, so, you can answer that. Yeah, so it essentially in my practice, we don't have a very high fidelity uh, MRI scanner. Take it live, Kapil. So, to answer the question about the adva selective advantage of MR orthogram over an MRI scan, the, uh, I think it depends on the quality of your MRI scanner. We don't have a three Tesla MRI scanner. And over the years, we've relied on MR orthograms. It allows us to pick up sudden, subtle labral lesions. I think the MR orthogram comes into its four where we have somebody with subtle instability, not a radiologically documented dislocation where you're worried whether you are dealing with instability or other pathology. And I do realize that Ashish Babulkar will probably uh, disagree with this because he's got a very good MRI scanner and access to very good radiology service. So in my practice, as I said, to pick up the subtle lesions, I'm more confident picking them on an MR arthrogram rather than an MRI scan, probably because of the quality of my uh, MRI scanner. So there's no more questions. So we can go ahead with Dr. Deepak Joshi's talk. So over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, the organizer. So my talk is straightforward. It's uh, the bank card repair, the arthroscopic way. So what should we take uh, into account when we are doing? So this is one of my older, very older presentation when we started doing bank card repairs. So. So on the, for the past, uh, we have learned, we used to do putty plat, open bank card, open various procedures, boy chef, and all those things we were doing, open procedures, but we have realized that uh, we were trying to find a simple, effective, and reproducible uh, procedures complemented and facilitated by rehab, minimal moon loss, and acceptable complication rates. So these were the procedures. This is the procedure that we were looking for that we came in the form of an arthroscopic bank card repair. So typically, as Harjogan said, that the instability is the interior and what is bank card is a lesion of a labrum. It's a group of injuries of a labral ligamentous complex located from three o'clock to six o'clock position when we look at the glenoid in a clock way. So it's, uh, as you can see, it's in from three o'clock to six o'clock interior and we can have a posterior lesions too. Types, when it's a simple labral tear, it's a soft tissue bank card. Uh, that we see more often 
often associated with uh, a small chip when we call it an osseous bank card we can have a perthes lesion where we uh, when we go inside the joint it looks like a normal labyrin when we probe it we can actually detach the periosteum and the capsule and then it is called a perthes lesion alpha is another a common variant that we should the beginner should look for that if we don't see the labyrin the labyrin is somewhere below so we should try to see from the superior portal and try to detach it elevate it and bring it up above so uh, we should try to identify where the labrum is and it is can be associated with a cartilage lesion which is a flat mineral labral article defect so hill sex again the harjoven has very nicely told it's a infection it is a, it's every instability is a bipolar region that's what we believe uh, in most of the traumatic uh, instability traumatic dislocations and we had to take care of both the anterior as well as the posterior the hill sex component when we decide whether our soft tissue bankal repair will be successful or not so the treatment has evolved over a past few years in terms that we now better understand that it is not just the double breasting of the subscap all that is the, that is we don't have to just prevent the head from dislocating out but we have to treat what is actually damaged that is the labrum so if the labrum is torn then we have to retention and repair the labrum so that we have a good proprioception so so the patient feels that everything is normal inside and we can uh, really uh, go ahead with all the sporting activities he wants to do and the technology we have very good anchors now we have all sorts of anchors thin anchors which creates a very small hole in on the glenoid and the surgical techniques and over a period of time i think we all have evolved and we have good number of arthroscopic surgeons uh, who are practicing now advantage of the arthroscopic way is and with as with any other surgery it's a minimal surgical trauma we can treat everything we can treat the health sex we can treat the haggle or haggle or we can treat the slap along with it and it has less of soft tissue dissection and the shorter surgical time and the patient recovers the movement the most important thing with the open uh, that was there with the open procedure the loss of motion that is not there when we do it in an arthroscopic way so what is our goal is to restore retention and repair that is uh, what is aim so whatever is as with an acl or a knee a lesions now in the shoulder also do it is restore what the anatomy whatever is torn where where it is torn just repair that thing so if the labrum is torn stitch the labrum to the place where it was there if the capsule along with that you retension the capsule and restore the length of the glenohumeral ligaments uh, in an arthroscopic procedure so that the patient has good proprioception patient feel better that everything is normal inside so that's a normal on the left side is a normal with labrum and that's how the when i probe it the labrum is torn that's how the bank card is going to look again it will be discussed again and again this is uh, how we have evolved in last few years that we have started doing lots of replacages i think uh, dr shekhar will also tell about we for a successful bankard repair good results we have to look for the defects on the glenoid side and on the hill sac so it is less than 25% as the, by the toy and bankard it's on track do it do then go for a arthroscopic bankard repair if it is off track add something to it dr shekhar will tell if it is more than 25% on glenoid loss and on track then we can go for a latarge and more than 25% off track go for latarge remplissage or a humeral bone grafting along with it but uh, this is a old study i think 2012 it is so now we are uh, um, we are accepting less and less bone loss on the glenoid side so and some studies have stated that if, if it is 13% or more loss in an uh, contact uh, athletes we should go for a retarge in those so we have we should know what exactly we want to do so good patient selection and the surgical technique is very important do a detailed examinations look for the number of dislocation if it is more if the patient is able to reduce himself go look uh, as was discussed earlier go for the ct and the and evaluate the patient pre op what exactly you want to do want to do an arthroscopic way or you have to add something to it so contraindications uh, so we have a significant bone loss gross capsular insufficiency voluntary dislocators so we we try to be a little bit uh, reserved 
in a simple arthroscopic bankal repair when we do look for these conditions principles are we have to mobilize release the labrum so much that when we repair it we have a tension free repair so that the repair doesn't go off when the patient is awake and the when the patient is doing exercises use minimum 3 or 4 anchors perform a capsular tuck and address for the laxity of the capsule and do a so patient should be a coper patient should be ready to go for a supervised rehabilitative program for about 6 months if the patient is not ready to immobilize himself not don't going to follow then go not don't go for uh, this procedure so again this is one of my very old videos so looking from the posterior portal we use two standard endoro inferior lateral the portal standard anterior and the superior portals so we can see how release how much release looking from we are looking from the posterior and working from the anterior portal you can see we how well we release the labrum so that we have a tension free repair and uh, so one anchor is put so these are the older time so the first anchor is at around 530 this is at the level of bare spot you can see this is the bare spot so that is around 430 and we uh, should uh, again as i emphasize we have to do a tension free repair so we should release it properly and uh, uh, as you can see we are shuttling the suture while we are shuttling the suture look at the anchor the eye should be at the anchor there should not be movement of any sutures on the uh, at the anchor side so we are not offloading the anchor so we can take a good wide little bit of capsule and a labrum and the aim is inferior to superior shear so we are retensioning the labrum as uh, retensioning the capsule the glenohumeral ligaments from inferior to superior area so we are taming the side to side repair as well as inferior to superior shear so you can see in this anchor this is the second anchor at the level of around 4 430 position at the level of bare spot so this is a classical way uh, we do when we have a simple soft tissue bank cart region with us so that's how it, uh, now we are tying the knots you can see we can have a good bumper effect the anchors are placed on the face of the glenoid 2 to 3 mm inside so that we can have a good bumper effect so nowadays that we have these are the as i told you we have stopped using metal anchors we are most of the times we are using bio composite anchors now we have switched on to the all suture anchors so these those are the anchors because those anchors are very thin and uh, they don't damage the cartilage that much so that's how the third anchor is put third anchor is at 3 o'clock 3 o'clock is basically at the level of the upper border of the subscapularis so 1 2 and 3 so we can have a good chalk block effect you can see the bare spot one anchor is above the bare spot one below and one it is at the level of the bare spot so that's how we do and again we look for the concomitant pathologies so knotless anchor we used to do lots of knotless uh, repair we have now we use most of the times when we are doing a bony banker we put a knotless anchor below and above and a knot at the level so that's how we do now but this just for the showing uh, sake of showing that if we can do the repair in a knotless way so we have put two anchors already we have passed the suture lasso through the from the anterior portal retrieving from the superior portal and we pass a wire through it and we pass a fiber wire and then we put a knotless way principles of the repair is very important uh, we have to see that there is no much of a bony loss uh, i had videos of that i think dr shaker will show this we have to intraoperatively assess how much bone loss is there after assessing onto the ct scan before and mobilize the tissue well you can see how well the labrum is coming on to the face of the glenoid creating a bumper effect as we hammer the anchor in so this is a push lock anchor that we used to do and we still use in selected cases these uh, types of anchors so that's how the repair is and again that's a rampli saj i think dr shekhar will show uh, we have to look for i'll just make it forward so we put the, in this uh, video i was just want to show you want to do a rampli saj so first put the remplissage anchors and uh, take a tissue bite along with it and then do a classical bankal repair so this is how again the bankal repair is being done so the idea what i want to show with this uh, video is that you have to assess the concomitant pathology the soft tissue bankal repair will be successful only when you uh, 
uh, treat the concomitant pathologies along with it. Uh, I think I'll skip this. So post-operatively, uh, patient we generally immobilize for about four weeks to six weeks. Patient is allowed to do normal activity like brush, put tie in the belt, and uh, ABR is uh, avoided. At around four weeks, we start doing the external rotation. Six aim is that for first uh, six weeks we have some immobilization, and about six to twelve weeks we aim is to gain full movement and. Uh, mm -hmm. After that, uh, we uh, gain full strength in about six months' time. That's how we start then, then allow to play. So with the advancement of techniques, uh, recurrence rates are now comparable to the open procedures, but the arthroscopic technique addresses the actual pathology, the Bankar lesion. It also enables to address the concomitant pathologies. And with meticulous techniques, most of the bony deficiencies can be managed. So one has to be careful uh, while doing the Bankar when we put a hardware inside, the anchor has to be put below the arterial margin with a firm purchase in the subchondral bone so that the anchor is not pulled out and also it doesn't damage the, if it is proud, then it will damage the overlying cartilage. You have to place three anchors at least, that's what we believe. Three or more anchors has to be put below the three o'clock position. If you try to uh, repair above the three o'clock position, you will end up in having a uh, loss of external rotation and the anchors are First anchor is around 530, then at around four, at 45 degree to the arterial surface. The second is at the bare spot, and the third is at 11 or 3 o'clock. When you have an Elsa lesion, look from the superior portal, mobilize the tissue well, bring the entire capsule and tissue to the level of the joint so that when we repair it, uh, we don't have a, a repair intention. So we have a tension free repair. And if you have a haggle, you have to repair that thing. Hill sex, uh, you have to tackle that thing. So if the, if the bone loss is around less than 15%, we can just go for a simple soft tissue repair. 15, 25% is a gray zone. We have to visit this. Uh, you have to carry out which repair you want to do a bony repair, uh, in bony bank card incorporation within ramp lissage or a lethargy. And if more than 25%, I think you have to go for a glenoid bone reconstruction. So the success for the arthroscopic bank card is the correct patient selection. Good surgical technique, treat the associated lesion, and the practice, of course, the practice is the most important aspect of it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak, sir, for a nice presentation and very good videos. Uh, on request of Dr. Babulkar, we are taking the questions for this uh, talk after this uh, Babulkar sir's talk. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Harjoban. Thanks, Shekhar, uh, for this webinar. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Trust everybody is well and uh, are safe in this uh, current very awkward situation. Um, I'll uh, highlight a few of my thoughts on the glenoid bone defect. And Shekhar said that I he would like me to allude to both the bony bank art and the bone loss on the glenoid side. And these are quite often mixed. So I'm going to kind of cram two different techniques or principles within the same presentation in a 15 minute uh, thing. So firstly, uh, for the youngsters, uh, for the fellows, let us make a very clear distinction between what is normal glenoid, what is bone loss, and what is bony bank art. And I say this because I have had a couple of uh, queries from fellows and I have revised a couple of cases where the surgeon was relying on an MRI, went in and found a bony bank card and quickly did a latage. And so let me make this very clear that the latage is for chronic bone loss and not designed to handle a fresh bony bank card. And a fresh bony bank card, we would do our maximum to go and do an anatomical repair and retain the fragment and that integrates quite beautifully. So the latarge is not a solution for a difficult, big, or major high velocity injury. So having cleared that thought, then we'll proceed. The other query can be, uh, I have often received this from my fellows that what's a glenoid fracture and what's a bony bank art. So anything that is secondary to chronic instability, 
related to a throwing athlete or uh, is likely to be a bony bankard we're not dealing with that single episode where the first time he's had a road traffic accident and has taken the anterior column of the glenoid off that becomes a bony uh, that becomes a glenoid fracture and should be treated like a glenoid fracture because then the classification and the iceberg and uh, whether associated scapula injury is a completely different ball game so let's not go down that stream irrespective of whether there is a bony bank art or a glenoid fracture what we must understand is that fracture of fragment is rendered avascular you know, which means that the fragment derives its vascularity from the parent glenoid and if you leave it like that it is less likely to sustain and over time we will shrink progressively leading to a glenoid bone loss so as i said the trigger for operating a patient with a bony bank art should be higher your threshold should be lower and i would go and fix them more commonly rather than the one without the bony bank art if you believe sugaya series he says 80% of his instability patients have some form of bony fragment and pricing where you don't see anything like this patient that you're seeing here Uh, was diagnosed as a standard bank card we went in and then there's a flake of bone always attached to the labrum we would preserve this treat it like a bank card but that flake of bone probably helps a better quality integration which just means that you need a much more judicious technique of bringing that back into place as if you're reducing a fracture it's i'm not sure whether it's related to a high velocity injury it probably is in the younger individuals but in the elderly it's probably related to the osteoporotic bone try not to rely on your x-rays and mris for diagnosing bony bank cards especially if you're relying on one tesla 1.5 tesla the three tesla uh, images that we are now used to are very good at picking up these changes of gray shades uh, on the mri uh, ensure you have bleeding surface so when you have a bony bank card you're going to freshen both the fragment side and the glenoid side and perhaps sometimes use dual anchors so i see a much more uh, preponderance of bony bank cards in post bank card failures because the previous anchors present as a stress riser and the fracture line passes through them number 1 and number 2 consistently if i have an elderly lady who's had a dislocation uh, invariably they dislocate with a chunk of bone because of the in swing osteoporosis if you have a bony bank card your options are if it's a big one you can use a cc screws that's more in tune for the glenoid fracture patients most of the time you're going to treat them with an anchor the one the flake that you saw with the previous uh, uh, video was we were treated like a bank card to pair and the ones that are rather bigger are kind of going to tilt if you use a single row a uh, bank card and today i would probably emphasize more on the double row technique just so that you are aware of it now this is a typical she is a 50 year old lady uh, fell at home in an awkward manner from a landing and uh, no history of dislocation but she wouldn't allow us to touch her because she was grossly unstable i immediately sense that if you look closely to the anterior column you can see something funny there there's a double cortical uh, shadow there and so you do a ct scan a 2d ct scan shows a small flake and you say okay this is undisplaced and i could treat this conservatively but the real giveaway is the sagittal reconstruction of the 3d uh, reconstruction of the sagittal glenoid and i had job and alluded to this i'm not sure how many of you were uh, keen but this is a very very important part of his presentation that you must ask for a 3d reconstruction with a sagittal reconstruction of glenoid subtracting the head of humerus now imagine if the head of humerus is not subtracted then you're going to miss out on this and it might look like a very trivial fragment which is in position likely to heal for the glenoid bone loss there's a very simple sign which is uh, twice been reported as if it was reinventing the wheel uh, where is double cortical sign where you can see here on the x ray in the b column on the right that it has lost its cortical shadow usually it's about a 20% glenoid bone loss that will lead to a positive double cortical sign for the bony bank art uh, there is no guarantee that it will heal because it's, uh, i think a much more challenging surgery than a conventional bank art uh, this is another patient uh, middle aged 
again something funny looking uh, seen at the anterior glenoid and the 3d images show a large big uh, triangular fragment the fragment is thin it is like uh, like a papad and it's difficult to fix this with cc screws and it's likely to shatter and sugaya has a bone stitcher that passes sutures through the bone uh, i'm not very good at this and my worry is that i might convert it into a comminuted fragment and so my preference is suture anchors here and this is the six month post op reconstruction the fragments integrated beautifully uh, on the x rays you'll see metal anchors because initial this is a case from about 10 years back the because this is osteoporotic there at the you're passing the anchor through the fracture site i was very concerned about the purchase quality stand that's why i used metal anchors for the uh, lateral row and i use a peak anchor for the medial row but now i think with the peak anchors coming in and uh, we have a much better quality of anchor so we we need not use uh, metal anchors as such this is a much more recent case 6 uh, 7 months back again if you look very closely at the x ray you can see there's some disruption in the cortical line and that should be a very uh, subtle sign and that should alert you that i need a ct scan for this patient in fact this lady came in with an mri initially uh, this is the actual ct scan and you see oh that's okay looks just like a small crack in the bone and this was an initial mri this is a three tesla mri and you could see oh well looks okay and we are good to do a bony bank card g62 and uh, there you see that there's a fragment of bone there or this this sometimes just a blunting of the anterior edge of the glenoid and the actual ct is deceptive so it's very easy to be befuddled on why is this lady so unstable and the sagittal sections are much more revealing so always insist on 3d and if you don't have uh, the resources it's sometimes we bring the cd of the ct scan and we do the 3d reconstructions on osirix ourselves so she had a loose body you could see this uh, the view from the anterior portal that looks reasonably okay and it looks innocent because the bony fragment is trapped underneath the labrum but the first thing i would do is put in a double loaded anchor with uh, four sutures in there and that has to go far more mm -hmm. medial uh, far beyond the uh, labrum and that's tricky because you are crossing the brachial plexus while you are doing that and the big best part of the technique of using double row suturing is you don't need to pass it through the labrum or through the fragment at all so once you've got the medial anchor bobs your uncle because it's a much more easier procedure and i'll give you the principles of that and this is the three month uh, ct scan where the fragments are integrated beautifully in this patient just to give you the principle of this technique let me speed up this video a little um here you have a pony bank card and uh, the fragment is displaced medially my idea is to come in and use the superior portal pass in an anchor far more medial to the fracture site this is typically going to be a double loaded 5.5 anchor uh, once you've had this then the smart thing to do is to try and get those sutures underneath on the medial side of the labrum inside that fragment and uh, so this is tricky because you're coming with a very very medial portal so you need to see the axial nerve and then do this don't do this without Uh, identifying the axial nerve once you have done this then the rest bit is very tricky you just put in two standard uh, anchors 2.8 or whatever you choose uh, typically we use uh, peak or the bioabsorbables and you put one of them at around 530 the other at around 230 and the idea is just to mate these so this is the pulley technique we use the medial suture to mate with the lateral suture without having to pass them through either of the ligament or the fragment so here you pick up one set of sutures and you could do alternate sets as well and tie them with the one pair and so they actually reduce the fragment and pull them in so you're not messing around with the fragment you kept the fragment in toto and it actually pulls in and reduces the fragment together uh, the only challenge is getting that medial anchor in place without having to deal with the nerves uh, on the medial side so this is our final picture and it's a very robust very strong repair and uh, it obviates the question of dealing with the rough cancerous bone inside because that is a very weak bone
So here, that's the first anchor coming in medially. That's usually a double loaded anchor. And then you have two more anchors coming in on lateral. Let's move quickly to the glenoid bone loss. As Harjuban very uh, correctly represented there, there are enough techniques. Now, it's very nice to speak in theory about these techniques. In practice, especially in a busy practice, it's impossible to do these on your own. And then you want your radiologists who are also equally busy. And if they make errors in judgment, then it's your patient and your practice that is going to suffer. I find this fairly impractical to do all these uh, logarithmic calculations. And I'm very calculation agnostic. So our technique is very simple. Get the data on CT scan of both shoulders and measure the widest AP diameter of the lower sector of glenoid and compare the dim dimensions. And on the top, you see on the normal side is 25. On the affected side is 23. So there's just a 2 mm bone loss. And this is perfectly OK. Uh, every millimeter of bone loss equates 4% glenoid bone loss. So when you have a 5 mm bone loss, you're dealing with a 20% glenoid bone loss. That's it. The options in the presence of a bone loss are, of course, Lataje, you could decide open arthroscopic. You could decide whether you want the Walsh classic technique with the CA ligament or the congruent arc described by Jody Beer. We won't go down that. It doesn't matter whether you do open arthroscopic or whether you do either of technique. Whatever uh, floats your boat, uh, you can work on those. When to use the ICBG is, again, another issue, and we'll deal with that. And the Bristol, I think, is pretty much historical. We don't need to go down that line. Uh, these are videos of arthroscopic uh, latage, but the same exact principle apply for the open latage as well, where your graft must be adequate. It should be in the inferior sector. It has to be flush with the glenoid articulating surface, and the screws have to have a good alpha angle, which means about 15 to 20 degrees angled so that you're perpendicular to graft, you ensure graft healing, and you're not uh, messing around with the uh, suprascapular nerve. At the end, because your surfaces are flush, then you've not introduced arthritis to this patient as such. And this is not easy. Whichever lataji you do, whether I do an open or arthroscopic, I'm challenged all the time. I think we need the maximum concentration and commitment. These are both not very easy procedures to do as such. This is an example of a 32-year-old epileptic. We had to postpone a surgery twice because she had a seizure the previous day. And so I would rarely ever do surgery for a patient who's not controlled on seizures. Now she has bilateral recurrent dislocation, extensive bone loss. If you look on the right side, she has a AP diameter, which is 23 mm. And on the left side, it's a 16 mm diameter. So this is like the excess of 30% glenoid bone loss. Now we can't do percentage calculations, but when you're faced with a bilateral situation, we use the normal native measurement of 25 mm. And based on that, we calculate that this is 16 mm. So she's got nine mm of glenoid bone loss. And that's extensive. And in such a case in an epileptic, I would prefer to do a ILEC crest bone graph. Uh, because you can get a larger graft. And in epileptics, because the conjoint is not attached, it's less likely to dislocate if it doesn't heal. If it heals, then it doesn't matter whether you've done a latage or a uh, edin hibernate with the uh, ilacris bone graft. So we've done this uh, for her. Whatever happens, uh, whether you do a latage or ICBG, at between three to six months, I beseech you to go and get a CT scan because there is no guarantee that that graft will heal as such. So it is very important that we check. And it's a big learning curve for me also to understand what mistakes I have done. I think there are the last three slides left. Uh, I'm on, I know I'm at 15 minutes. Um, these are three articles that I would like to refer to you. Number one, this is JP Warner's article, how to do an ICBG graft. And very nicely, he's represented how to use the inner table, which is much more smoother. The other tip, I would like to share from our practice is this posterior part of the ilex crest should go inferior. So you revert the graft because then it matches identically. The curvature is actually made for each other. And it's a beautiful reconstruction at the end of it. As I said, you must do your CT scans at three to six months to ensure that there's no screw problem. There's no osteolysis starting up and the graft has integrated well. A word of caution, this is Palladini's and Pocellini's article with comparison between acute and chronic bony bank cards, their dislocation rates after surgery were one case in each group. But 
the restoration of function was poorer in the chronic uh, bony pancreas. So they are not the same because the graft has shrunk. There's not enough meat on the bone. So be careful on those uh, patients, especially if they are athletes and young people. This is the problem that I was alluding to. Unfortunately, we tend to compartmentalize everything into less than 25%, more than 25% and such. But uh, we are probably addressing, uh, giving a homogeneous answer to a heterogeneous problem. You must uh, factor in ligament laxity, whether it's a male or female, whether it's a contact athlete, and whether there's an associated heel sacs. And based on these, I will come to a decision whether to do a lethargy. So I have done a bank card repair for a young intern uh, who's a female, who's a, not an athlete, and who has had 20% bone loss, and they, she's doing very well. And there's no harm in doing that. And somebody else would have done a latage. And I don't think there is anything wrong between both our approaches. But it is very important not to compartmentalize everything into a very rigid zone, less than 25, more than 25. This is a paper from, uh, from Korea, in Cheon, where they compared subcritical bone loss. These are all patients with less than 20% glenoid bone loss. And although they had a good, reasonably good result, very less failure rate. The recurrence in the Bankard group was almost 23%. The recurrence in the Latage group was 6.5%. So there's a difference here. So this is, if you have a young athletic population, then you would err towards doing a Latage. And the interesting other finding was that external rotation was more restricted in Bankard than the Latage. There's, of course, a scientific reason for that. In the end, this is a post-Latage. If you have an athlete or a contact athlete, they do incredibly well after Latage, but all these next three slides that I'm showing you, this is a Hindi K3 champion who's achieved his Hindi K3 three years after a bank card repair. The younger guy on the bottom is a national swimmer who's achieved this after doing a bank card repair. And this is uh, a silver medalist at the Glasgow Commonwealth Games who've done a orthoswick cuff repair and bank card repair. So let's not get this message home that the latage is a solution to global warming. Uh, if there is no bone loss, there should not be a latage. The bank card is equally adept at restoring function, even in contact athletes. And that's my take. If you find something deficient, if you find there's an associated large hill sacs, then go ahead and complement it with a remplissage. But don't use latage as a gun to solve all the problems related to instability. It doesn't. So in take home, uh, last slide, uh, bony bank card to me is a priority. I would treat them. My threshold for operating them is much lower than a bank card. You must be able to discern a bony bank card versus a bone loss. Uh, use whatever technique that suits your practice. It doesn't matter whether you do it open. I would say in my first 10 years of practice, I would do all my bony bank cards open because that was a much robust way of doing it till I honed in my skills. And for the bone loss, you could choose coracoid, ICBG, depending on your practice. But there are a number of patients in the gray zone who are neither black or neither white. In these cases, you need to take a judicious decision based on your skills, based on your experience. Otherwise, take an opinion and then decide. And then you must always confirm postoperatively whether the graft has healed, because a graft that has not healed will have problems, complications, and then you are not appropriate for sending them to their scores. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, sir, for a very informative talk. And <clears throat> I have a question for you. You uh, yes. were fixing body bank cards. So what is your time limit till what time you think of uh, fixing the body bank card? You mentioned acute versus chronic. So would you fix chronic bank cards or you would plan for latter days in this? Uh, good question, Arjoban. If it's a sizable fragment, I would definitely fix, uh, go ahead and do a bony bank card repair. But if I think that the fragment has shrunk and the combined diameter is less than 25 and it's an athlete and it's a young person, then I might consider doing a latage. If it's a normal person who's a non-athlete, it doesn't matter if he's left with a 3mm deficit in the glenoid, they would still do well. Any, any questions from other panelists? We can we can take questions for Dr. Joshi's talk as well.
so dr deepak you were doing a, when you were doing a arthroscopic bank card you were using posterior portal as your viewing portal so do you always use your posterior portal as your viewing portal or what is your preferred portal for viewing doing arthroscopic bank card actually this is how we trained ourselves and uh, this is how i have done so i go from the superior portal i look at the labrum look at the uh, alpha or where the labrum and mobilization is why the by looking from the superior portal okay but when i do repair so that's how i have been trained so but when i repair then i go posteriorly and do it again so it's just a matter of preference only but the releasing part has to be done by looking from the superior portal because then exactly you know where exactly is the labrum and how much you have to mobilize and how much it is required to come in yeah. that 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 portal gives you the best view yeah so any any questions from other panelists deepak just a, uh, you said you used to use knotless anchors but you don't use them anymore any reason particular reason the reason i asked this question is that i've used the same knotless anchors for last 13 years and i've not changed my technique at all and so um, why did you you started knotted then you moved knotless and then you back to knotted why uh it just let uh, sometimes the anchor used to come out and i it just a feel that because when you put a knot on it it's a feel that okay the thing is secure that always used to lack when i used to put a knotless anchor that is the only reason otherwise as far as the result wise is concerned all the patients i think probably are doing better as then we visited i think barkard i think dr chaudhary then after that i visited so we we then from his philosophy the first anchor has to be the knot at the lower most anchor so so when we visited after that we really changed completely now we very very less often that we use a not at a not less anchor so it's not it's, it's not as far as the results are concerned uh, nothing i don't think uh, there, there was much difference in me it's just that we felt we feel secure when we put a knot that the tissue is coming and creating a knot so i so i have never used a knotless anchor so i i can ask you before that uh, can you get the same amount of bumper effect which you get with a knotted anchor yeah exactly so it's very good so if you take a bite and you have seen this you know, the 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 anchor that i had shown in my video when it's you get almost the same bumper if you take a good bite uh, but it's just a feel okay. we i have seen a person because i visited uh, dr martin i think in holland he used to put all he always put knotless anchor so after putting the knotless put doing the repair he used to take out the scope and he used to do full abr and then he used to go inside again and see whether uh, anything is ruptured or the anchor is getting he used to show that show us that how good knotless anchor are there there nothing they don't get loose it just that we stopped doing it and uh, we are happy with the knotted ones It is interesting, Shaker, that you know when you use a knotless anchor, once you've taken your first bite as low as possible, you get it. If you're using a knotless anchor, you can actually pull it to wherever you want. You know, mm -hmm. so you're not bound by the position of your first anchor that you put at five thirty. Let's say you take an inferior bite and you want to pull it up, and that capsule then shifts to let's say even four o'clock. Just do that, and then you can reinforce two more anchors below that, and that helps. So I've always felt that using a knotted anchor. actually is counter intuitive because you're now determined by your post position while if you're doing a knot less you can pull your post to wherever you want to and that gives you a better shift and as far as your bumper you know in my talk there is a little video but you can get a very good bumper and harjoban will testify to that when he was with us that's all we used to do always done a knot less anchor and never repented that and i've always worried about the knot um, stack as well i know all the knotted guys will tell me that they try and put the knot medially which is away from the the articular surface but i don't know what happens when the water gets out of the joint where does that knot stack then sit is the other worry that i've always had so but that's a philosophy and as i said i have not repented using knotless anchors and that's what i've always done uh 
but we can get the same effect if we take the byte first and then we put the anchor. Like we use a, a shuttle technique. So we first take the byte to the capsule and the labrum. And then based on the position of the byte, we put our anchors. So yes. that also you can get the same effect here. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is what you're used to, you know, and I, as I said, but the answer to your question was, I think we can get a equilibrium shift and a good bumper with Nautilus anchors as well. Especially now the tapes are there. So with the labrum tape, you get a broader area of contact and that's much kinder to tissues and there is less friction. There is more friction in that as well. So that's actually quite a good advance as well. I think uh, we can move on to the next talk. Uh, mm. Dr. So you can share your screen. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we have discussed that how bony defects matter a lot in shoulder instability. So management of shoulder instability is not just bank card repair, but bank card repair plays a very good role, a very important role in management of anterior shoulder instability. Now, when the arm is by the side of your shoulder, then the stability is usually provided by the negative intraarticular pressure. And in the mid range, it is the concavity compression effect, which is uh, providing the stability. The ligaments and the capsule are important for the end range stability. Now, why does bone loss occur? Now, it can be because of avulsion. So there can be an avulsion of a bone piece along with the labrum. There can be attritional plenoid bone loss because of repeated dislocation. And on the humeral side, you get hill sacs region. So his sex region is basically a posterior superior defect in the humeral head. So when the head dislocates and it, the posterior superior part of the head, it bangs against the anterior border of the glenoid, which is quite hard and sclerotic, and that creates an impression. So his sex region is supposed to be present in almost 65% of the patients after first dislocation. And it is reported to be present in almost 100% of the cases with recurrent dislocation. Now, why does bone loss matter? We have been hearing this again and again in all the previous talks that though arthroscopic bank card repair very good results, but still the failure rate are almost in the range of 10 to 15%. Okay. And the major cause of this failure is poor selection of patients. That is failure to assess the bone loss. So if there is a bone loss, then whatever good technique you follow, it's going to fail. So here you can see that when the arm is in full abduction and external rotation, the capsule and ligaments, they become tight and that is the primary stabilizing force. Now, if there is a glenoid bone loss and you have done a bank cut repair and the arm is in full abduction, the end range, the capsule still remains tight and it will hold the head. But in mid flexion, when the shoulder, when the capsule becomes lax, then the head falls into this pouch. So that puts stress on your big repair and slowly it stretches out. Now, similarly, what happens in hill sacs lesion? Now, when your arm is in abduction and external rotation, then the posterior superior part of the head is supported by anterior part of the glenoid. Now, if this hill sacs lesion is small and a part of the head is still supported by the glenoid, then your bank cut repair will stay. 
it's going to be successful. But if your Hillsax lesion is large, then even after repair, it is not supported by the glenoid. The head is not supported by the glenoid. So then it engages into the glenoid and it engages into the entry part of the glenoid. This again stretches your repair and it will lead to failure. So whatever good repair you do, however good repair you do, if your bone loss is big enough, then it's going to stretch upon your soft tissue and it's going to fail. So you cannot say that I had a, a bony lesion, but I did a very good repair, very strong bumper. No, it may hold on for some time, but slowly as the head engages into the glenoid, it will stretch your repair and it's going to fail. Now, most of the failure which we talk about doesn't happen immediately. If you follow a patient for five to 10 years, then you will actually know the failure rate of Bancard. Now, these bony lesions, they don't happen in, they don't occur uh, in isolation. So it's not that you will just have a glenoid bony defect or a hill sex lesion. Usually there is a bipolar defect. So there will, there will be a hill sex lesion and then there will be a glenoid lesion as well. So when you assess whether your hill sex lesion is uh, significant or not, then you have to keep both in mind, the, the, uh, the amount of hill sex lesion or the degree of hill sex lesion and the degree of glenoid bone loss. Now, initially there was uh, this method of dynamic assessment where the hill sex lesion was assessed intraoperatively while doing arthroscopy. The arm was uh, taken into abduction and external rotation. And we uh, used to see whether the lesion is uh, engaging, the hill sac lesion is engaging into the glenoid or not. But if you haven't repaired your bank cut, then there is no constraint to prevent this hill sac lesion engaging the glenoid. Okay. So if you want to really assess whether this hill sac is engaging or not, then it has to be assessed after bank cut repair. Okay. Now, many of us are doing this surgery in lateral position. So then it becomes quite problematic to do abduction and external rotation in this position. And secondly, you are always uh, app apprehensive that you may damage the repair. You may stretch out the repair. So the most uh, important thing or the uh, thing which has to be done uh, to assess the glenoid bone loss is to do it preoperatively. So we have discussed about the glenoid tract technique, which was uh, explained by Dr. Harjovan. So that's very important to assess that whether your hill sac lesion is significant or not. So normally in abduction and external rotation, the posterior superior part of the head articulates against this part of the glenoid. Now, if your hill, so you, so let's come here. So you draw this glenoid track on the posterior super part of the head. Now, if your hill sac lesion is within the glenoid track, then you can just do the bank cut repair. You don't have to address the hill sac lesion. Okay. If your hill sac lesion is beyond the glenoid track, that means it is off track, then you have to address the hill sac lesion. Now, how to draw this glenoid track? that you have to again and go through the literature and study. It takes into account both the defect in the uh, head, uh, head of the humerus, as well as defect in the glenoid. So by doing that on CT scan preoperatively, you can assess whether your hill sac lesion is within the glenoid tract. If it is within the glenoid tract, then it is known as on track lesion. If it's an on track hill sac lesion, then you don't have to address it you can leave it as such and only your bank cut repair will be okay. Now, if your hill sac lesion is beyond the glenoid tract, then it becomes off track and that needs to be addressed. So based on that, you can divide it into four groups. Now, if the glenoid defect is less than 25%, then you can just do bank cut repair. If, it is, if the hill sac lesion is on track, bank cut repair alone is enough. If the hill sac lesion is off track, you have to add remplissage to the bank cut. And 
if the glenoid effect is more than 25%, then the Bankart repair is not going to work and you have to do some bony procedure like lethargy. And if you have such a big hill sacs lesion that even after doing lethargy, it is off track, then you have to add some other humeral procedures like uh, you have to do either bone grafting procedure or some other thing. So if we talk about the management of humeral head bone defect, if the hill sacs lesion is small, it is on track, it doesn't require any treatment, okay? Or imagine a situation where there is also a glenoid bone defect and you are doing a lethargy for that. Now, if you have done a lethargy, then you have effectively increased the arc, okay? Now, as you have increased the arc, so the glenoid arc also increases and probably an off-track hill sex lesion has now become on track. So in that case also, you don't need to do anything. So if you have done a lethargy, probably this lesion has now become on track and it doesn't require any treatment. But in an off-track hill sex lesion, you can fill it up either with a soft tissue, which is usually a capsulomuscular, the infraspinatus and the capsule that is used to fill up the defect that is known as remplissage. It, was, it can be done by open technique, but mostly it is done arthroscopic. If the defect is very large, more than 35% to 40%, and if you try to fill that up with a soft tissue, then you are going to constrain the shoulder. Then the movements become quite restricted. So in those cases, you have to do some open procedure. You can fill them up with osteochondral bone allografts, or you can do derotation osteotomies, or even sectoral resurfacing or hemiarthroplasty. Now, there's also a new technique of disimpacting this bone which has depressed. So you make a cortical window here, and then you, with a uh, bone tamp, you just uh, disimpact and bring it back. That can be done only in acute cases, and then you fill it up with some bone graft and a screw. So remplissage is filling the defect with posterior capsule and infraspinatus. So that makes the defect extra capsular. So you see, this is a very big defect. The defect is extending quite medially. It's not the depth of the defect which is important. It's the extent of the defect. If the defect is extending more medially, that means it, there's more possibility that it is an off-track lesion. So again, a big uh, insect lesion. Now here you can see it's a narrow uh, his sex lesion, but it is away from the attachment of the uh, cuff. So again, this is a significant his sex lesion. And once you do the remplissage, then you fill up the defect and you can't see the defect. This is a small video demonstration of uh, doing remplissage. So, uh, so we are operating on a left shoulder. This is the anterior uh, glenoid uh, margin, humeral head and this is the posterior, and our scope is in the anterosuperior portal. And you can see the extent of the hill sacs lesion. Okay. Normally one anchor is enough, but uh, if you have a big lesion like this, then you need to use two anchors. So the first thing is that you do diagnostic arthroscopy. You see, uh, uh, you see the position of the labrum. If you want to release them, you can do that. Uh, then you come back to the hill sacs lesion. You decorticate it with the help of a burr or a shaver or a rasp. Uh, you want the tissues to heal to the uh, lesion. Uh, so you want to make them rough and uh, you want a bleeding surface. Then from the posterolateral portal, you uh, put the anchors. Now this is coming through the cannula. You took, uh, so these are two 5.5 uh, anchors. Now, after that, what we do, we retract the cannula into the subacromial space. And then with the help of these penetrators, we take mattress bite through that capsule and the infraspinatus muscle. Now, so after taking the bite through these tissues, uh, you leave them as such and come back to your bank out repair once you have completed your bank art repair, then you tie those sutures. So that is done blindly and the uh, knots are in the subacromial space. 
So you can see that the whole defect is now filled up with the tissue. This defect has now become extra capsular and it doesn't engage us. So the clinical results have shown good result with remplissage and imaging studies have shown successful uh, muscular capsular tenodesis in almost 75% of the cases. Uh, various studies have uh, shown the importance of remplissage in treating the off-track lesions. Uh, especially uh, I was going through the paper uh, by uh, Dr. Vivek Pandey and uh, where he compared treating uh, off-track lesions with Bancot alone and with remplissage. And there were significantly fewer redislocations in patients with off-track lesions who underwent Bancot repair and remplissage than in those who did not undergo remplissage. Now, in their study, they found that there was a restriction of movement of around uh, three to four degree, uh, which was statistically significant, but functionally they didn't find uh, it to be very important. Now, if your lesion is big, then as I uh, explained earlier that you can't do remplissage because then you will be really over constraining the joint. So in that case, you have to do open procedure. Uh, you can either uh, fill up the defect with an osteochondral uh, allograft. So it's an open technique where you go by deltopectoral approach. Then you externally rotate the shoulder so that the defect comes in front and then you fix it with headless screws. Or you can do derotation osteotomy. So I don't have any personal experience of this, but here you basically try to uh, derotate so that the lesion goes more posterior and it doesn't engages when the arm is externally rotated. Now, uh, there has been a systematic review which uh, compares all the humeral procedures, the remplissage, humeral osteochondral graft, Weber osteotomy, and shoulder arthroplasty for management of humeral bone defect. And their conclusion was that the arthroscopic remplissage is the safest technique for management of patients with shoulder instability with humeral bone loss. It is associated with lower rate of recurrence when compared with Bancard repair alone. And Weber osteotomy, humeral, humeral allograft reconstruction, shoulder arthroplasty, and hemiparthroplasty are characterized by high rate of recurrence, complication, and poor outcome scores. But that is understandable because these techniques are done in those patients where the defect is quite large. So to conclude, bony defects, to recognize bony defects, in a shoulder instability patient is very important. It's very important to preoperatively recognize whether your hill sex lesion is on track or off track, okay? Because accordingly, your treatment plan is going to change. Various studies have shown that failure to address off track hill sex lesion can cause increased redislocation rates. And bank card temperature is an effective procedure to reduce redislocation rates for off track lesions. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the nice presentation. <clears throat> I think that has cleared all the doubts about uh, addressing hill sac lesion. Uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Kapil Kumar to share his screen and start the next. While sir is sharing the screen, sir, can I ask a question? Which, which part of hill sacs do you put your anchor in? The medial part or depth of the hill sacs or the Uh, you have to unmute. Yes, sir, Juman. Uh, if the hill sacs is extending very medially, normally I would like to put my anchors close to the articular cartilage. But if the hill sacs is extending quite medially, and if you put it close to the articular cartilage, that means you are putting your anchor very medially, and you are taking a lot of bite through the tissue, then it might. Uh, restrict the motion. So in those cases, I go in the center, but mostly I try to put it uh, along the margin, along the articular margin. Over to you, Kapil, sir. So you can, you can start yeah. your presentation. Thanks very much, uh, Harjuban. Thanks for the invitation, Shekhar. I think a lot of things have been talked about in the previous talks and, you know, from the initial evaluation 
to addressing the bony defects and the importance of surgical technique by Deepak as well. So I'm trying to go and bring them together. I know I was supposed to talk about challenges of revision, shoulder stabilization, but I think the challenges are more in evaluating why the initial stabilization surgery has failed because unless you identify the problem, you really can't find a solution to that. So I'm gonna try and see what is the, what are the causes of failed shoulder stabilization? And I'm gonna focus on arthroscopic procedures. I'm not gonna go into the realms of failed lateral J procedures because that's a talk in itself. And how do I evaluate? And then I'm gonna bring some cases in which have failed. Some of them are mine, some of them are sent to me. And we can have a discussion about what caused the initial surgery to fail. Was there something that we could have changed in our decision-making or management? And how do we go forward? Okay. So first I'm gonna start with the basics. You know, what ensures shoulder stability? And we have learned that it's the capsule labral complex, which is the stabilizer of the shoulder. We know that an effective functioning rotator cuff is quite important for shoulder stability. We have learned from Ashish and Shaker's talks about the area of contact between the hybrid head and the glenoid. So there's a bone loss there. But I think one bit that is missing is the, which we often overlook is the incorporation of the muscles. You know, how are the rest of the periscapular muscles working? And hence I'll draw your attention to this Stanmo triangle. What we've been talking all about is the polar type one, which is the traumatic structural instability. But there's a huge group of the atraumatic structural instabilities, especially the young uh, adolescent teenage girls who are <laughs> double jointed, who, are, um, who come to you with symptoms of instability, they feel their shoulders coming out, but they may never have had a true dislocation. And then, then lastly is what is poorly understood amongst most of these surgeons <laughs> is the, the non-structural muscle patterning groups where it is a, probably a muscle dysfunction of scapular stability and the other muscles, which leads to this symptoms of stability. And hence, it's very important to recognize that these, the type twos and type threes, may be the contributors to your failed surgery where you did everything right, but you, you have got a failure in front of you. So we'll try and bring these things together. And we know, uh, you know, we have, seen excellent technique shown by Deepak about the, uh, what is the aim of surgery in arthroscopic surgery. The aim is to restore the capsular labral complex at the front, create this soft tissue bumper here. You want to address any concomitant rotator cuff pathology. Uh, sorry. And you want to address the bony defects uh, and then you want to rehab the patient. And that is the, if you do all these steps correctly, you are likely to get to a successful situation. And we know that Harjoman has told us that the numbers of arthroscopic stabilizations are going up. All of us have now got reasonably good arthroscopic skills to do this procedure. We have seen a huge development in techniques, anchors, the anchors are getting smaller, the sutures are getting stronger from sutures to tapes and etc. We're still doing that. And I think our success rates are improving. But still, if you look at the literature, you've got failure rates of up to about three to 25%, depending on which series you look at. And why are these failure rates happening? Why are we still failing with these procedures? So it's like a recipe book. You know, you open a, a book to, or a cookbook and you've got the ingredients. So what are the ingredients that we have got, which look at how to get, a, if I had to write a cook recipe for how to achieve a successful stabilization procedure. So what have we got? We've got a patient, we've got the surgeon, and we've got everything else, which is your implants, your anchors, your sutures, and your technique. And it's a combination, it's the ideal combination of these things that will enable us to achieve a successful outcome. So let's look at what goes wrong where. So who is your right patient? You know, we've listened to various evidence from the literature as to who is your, who is your at risk patient. We know that if you're a younger man, if you have a number of more number of dislocations, if you've had high energy injury, 
then you're at a higher risk of failure. It's still unpublished, but there is work from Wrightington Hospital from Len Funk's group. And they have looked at adolescent patients with undergoing stabilization and then returning to recovery. Their failure rates are about 80%. So imagine that eight out of 10 patients, you are doing an arthroscopic procedure, they're failing within 12 to 24 months because it's that age, it's the sport they're playing. Are we doing the right procedure? Have we missed something? Did we miss a Hagel lesion? Did we have a patient who was, initially, who was inherently lax and we have not addressed that capsule laxity? Remember your arthroscopic procedure is not just about stitching your bank card back. As Deepak told us, you have to tighten the, the, the ligament. You have to restore the proprioception. We've heard from Ashish and, Deep, and, and Shekhar about addressing the missing bony defect. And then are we doing the right person? Is it a pilot error? Have we done something wrong? Have we reduced the number of anchors that we were supposed to use? Have we put them in the right place? Did we have, was if we were using a knotted configuration, was our knot robust enough? You know, we heard somebody say that after the operation, they would put their patient through a full range of movement. Do we have the conviction and courage to do that? Or we are too scared and we say, right, we'll put them in a sling for six weeks and we'll be all be fine. So you have to go through things as to why your stability, instability, your stability surgery is failing. We've talked about these patient factors, you know, younger the patient, their competitiveness, and Harjavan told us about the, injured, the instability severity index score, uh, Pascal Bolu. Uh, so again, think about these things when you're assessing a patient with failed uh, stabilization. I'll skip over this, this is again addressing the same issues, but there is number of papers which tell you that if you've got a younger patient who's got a high energy injury, who's had multiple dislocations or needed to be reduced prior to their operation, then the revision procedures had high, uh, then your surgery is likely to fail and there's a high risk of failure. And this is very important here. Is this the right patient that this is a girl who's sitting there with her shoulders subluxed anteriorly. And I'm gonna talk about her in my case discussions later on. Is this the right person to go and do an arthroscopic procedure? This girl is, can dislocate her shoulder voluntarily. Should you be fixing on this person? Should you be operating on this person? Or is this person best served by something else? So again, you go and operate on these, you have got a high risk of failure. So think about it. So what do I do when I've got to evaluate a patient with, uh, who's come to me with having failed a previous stabilization procedure? Who is this patient in front of me? What's their age? What's their gender? But I really want to know from their history, what was the episode or what were the circumstances around the first dislocation they had? What magnitude of force went through their shoulder at the time of the first injury? How many dislocations did they have prior to getting their primary surgery? How reducible have their dislocations been? Have they just come out and gone back in or have they had to have them reduced every time that this happened? Then you want to know who was the surgeon who did the operation? What was this operation? Was it open? Was it arthroscopic? If at all, try and get all the data from that surgeon. Or if you did yourself, go back and look at your notes. How good was the tissue? How many anchors did you use? Did you take record the video or did you record any images? Look at them. Was there subsequent trauma? And this is all a part of your clinical evaluation. We haven't done any complex investigation and this gives you a lot of information before you decide to investigate them with further imaging. Then you start examining them. You want to see What's the range of motion? Are they apprehensive even putting their arm in slight abduction external rotation? Where is this apprehension? Is it high arc? Is it mid arc? Is it low arc? What's their cuff strength? Okay, good. You know, this man came to us with because he felt his shoulder was loose. He does not have a structural problem. He's got a poor muscle control. What is scapula? You know, if this is not a person who has had stabilization surgery, but he was sent to us as an unstable shoulder. If you operate on him, you're doomed. Look at if they've got inferior capsule laxity, this is the gauge sign here. If you've got 
more than 20 degrees difference between the two signs, they've got inferior capsular laxity. Look for other signs of laxity. Look at the sulcus, look at the Baton score. And then you go to imaging and we have discussed this, you know, radiograph, CT scan, and there was a question about MR or MR orthogram. In my practice, I do MR orthograms. You know, if you've got good radiology, good MRI scan, or you don't have access to MR orthogram, then you could do an MRI scan. But these are the investigations in that order that I will do for somebody who has had a failed instability surgery. Because we have heard in all the talks this morning that unrecognized bony defects are a biggest cause of failed uh, <clears throat> stabilization surgery. And I'm not going to dwell on the track and the glenoid bone loss and hill sacs defect and the size, et cetera, because we have done that in great detail. And then finally, you can have a look at an arthroscopy. Now this patient has had previous surgery because arthroscopy lets you look at what is the quality of tissue that you're looking at? Where is the anchors that have been put in? Is there a technical error that's been put in? Are the anchors too high? Are the anchors too medium? Is there any unrecognized bone loss? And is there cartilage damage? So you want to do all of that and you want to do a good arthroscopic evaluation because till you've done that, you really can't solve the problem. So I'll just go on to some of the cases. This is a 32 year old man who about three weeks ago presented to our emergency department with this injury. Now on this lateral view, which is a beautiful on fast uh, view of the glenoid, you can see that there is a little bit of glenoid bone loss here. Now this man, has had stabilization surgery done by me in 2011. Okay, this was his CT scan prior to his index operation. He had a small hill sacs. There was no glenoid bone loss. When we scoped him, a, this was a non-engaging bone defect. And I stabilized him with three knotless anchors in 2011. He's at a form now, and now he has got a dislocation. So now the question that I, and this is his x-ray now. So obviously there is a bit of glenoid bone loss and we heard from Ashish Babulkar telling us that you can have fractures to where your anchor holes were. This is now a chronic situation. It's 10 years down, nearly 10 years down the line. So the, the question here is, is it just a consequence of new trauma? Was that initial bone loss, which I dealt with soft tissue procedures, was that hill sac significant enough that I should have added replicage? 10 years ago, I was not doing replicages. Can I just blame this, all this on the new trauma? And now what? And I'm going to leave it open. You know, yes, I will get a CT scan. Yes, I will get an MR orthogram. But, you know, now what? Should I do another soft tissue procedure? Or because he's got new glenoid bone loss here, I should go for a bony procedure like a lateral and those are the questions that you have to think when you, this is very, this is a relatively simple case. He's had been operated for 10 years, things are easy. So he's still, uh, because he's in, on an NHS patient, he's waiting for a CT scan, which should be done soon, and then we'll plan his management. So I'll move on to another one now. This is a 22 year old man. And in 2014, he came to us with recurrent instability his first injury was playing rugby for which he needed a manipulation under anesthetic. He had further episodes of dislocations and when we scanned him, he had an anterior labral lesion and he had a posterior labral lesion. And he had a hill sacs. There was no glenoid bone loss. I'll just pause here for a second and ask Take a straw poll between Shekhar, Deepak, and Harjavan. What would you have done in 2014 for this man? He's a high energy injury. He's got no glenoid bone loss, and he's got a soft tissue injury in a hill sacs. I'll open the floor and I'll take your options. I think 2014 was a time when we were not doing ramplis as that much. So I would have gone for a simple soft tissue bank I'll repair in this. Okay. Shekhar. You have to unmute. Unmute. 
uh, soft tissue stabilization, both anterior and posterior. Okay. And maybe Harjavan, you were here at that time. Maybe we yes. did it. So, so anyway, so I did a, I did an arthroscopic procedure on him. And I find an extensive labral tear. He had a type four slap. So I had three anterior and two posterior knotless anchors because that's what I've always done. And initially he was fine. But you know, two years is not the time when you say your arthroscopic stabilization has been a success or a failure. So two years later, he, was, he went back playing rugby and he dislocated his shoulder again. He had fresh injury. At that time, this guy had moved from Aberdeen to Glasgow and he underwent another MR arthrogram in Glasgow. Surprisingly, they didn't do any CT scans there. You can see my anchor, the posterior anchor here. You've got work on the anterior side. So now he's dislocated again, two years later. I, unfortunately, as I said, they did not do any CT scans. So again, Shekhar, what would you do for him now? So on this MRI, still there's no bony lesion. There's no bony defect. And if the labral quality is good, then I would go for uh, refixation, bank cut again. He's got five anchors already in his glenoderm. Where are you going to put your other anchors? Hmm. I can I can say that I didn't put the anchors. I don't put anchors above two o'clock on the glenoid. So all the anchors are below. Yeah. So that is a challenge now, isn't it? Where will you put your anchors? Yeah. Deepak? I think um, I will go for a bony procedure in this that RJ. That is what we follow in our scenario where we have lots of wrestlers coming with us. So the first stage is first surgery is always a soft tissue procedure. We try to do that. But the second one, I really in these patients, in the professional rugby player, I tend to do a lethargy in these, in these cases. Harjavan? I would think of doing a lethargy as well, sir. Yeah. Since so, he has high chance of uh, getting this getting after a bank card repair again. So anyway, so in 2016 in Glasgow, and this is a very good surgeon in Glasgow, he did a further arthroscopic stabilization. Unfortunately, I don't, could not get access to his records. So I don't know where he put the anchors, how many anchors did he put? So now, Four years later, he fell again outside a swimming pool and he has got an anterior dislocation. And these are his investigations now. So you can see there are multiple holes in the glenoid from where our anchors have been. He has got a hill sacs lesion, which is actually quite high, which is again a worrying thing because the higher your, uh, the location of a hill sacs, that's more worrying. And that is why if you go back to the uh, instability severity index score, the uh, the hill sacs being visible on an external rotation actually yeah. used that means the hill sacs is higher more superior and that's a higher risk factor so again what i'm trying to come to here is that if i go back to the 2015 scans we agreed that there was a hill sacs but there was no glenoid bone loss and probably that was the right operation to do in 2016 should you have a latter j should he have had a latter day after repeat dislocation, considering somebody's playing rugby, is still young. Uh, now, the issue is, I don't think there's a position place for soft tissue procedure now, and we probably will all agree that we'll do a latter day now. Would yeah. everybody agree? Yes. yes. So then, Shekhar, the point is, he's had so many anchors in his, in his glenoid, so when you will go and do a latter day, are you worried about those anchor positions and potential weakness in the glenoid with all those anchor holes? Or you are not worried about that at all? Considering that I can tell you the anchors that I use are all peak. And I know that the guy in Glasgow who, who did this operation, he does exactly the same as I do. So he would have put further peak anchors in it. So now he's got about five or six or seven peak anchors in his glenoid. Are you now worried about how to play? Where would you, you know, your fixation of your latter J uh, graft? So uh, I would like to uh, go ahead and try to do the normal lethargy. Uh, you can drill through the peak anchors and the screws which we are using, uh, they have to get a good hold on the opposite cortex. 
so that is uh, i think that is quite okay you had done you have done a post in this case uh, you have done posterior uh, labral repair also yeah but uh, those were two two anchors and yeah. it's almost uh, six seven years now so i think uh, if we get a good purchase in the posterior cortex of the glenoid then that should not be a problem okay so now I'll come to this one. Now this girl, she's about, I think 16 or 17 now. And when I met her, she was about 14 or 15. And she had had no problem with her shoulder. She was a very, she used to do gymnastics at school. And one day while she was on the, the, the uh, I think one of the halls, you know, the, the vaulting horse or whatever, she fell and she injured her shoulder. And this is how she presented to the emergency department. Her shoulder was subluxed. You can see it's antro inferiorly subluxed. So this was a first time dislocation with no previous shoulder problems. And she was taken to theater by the, the trainees. They attempted to reduce it, but every time they put it back, it came out again, even as soon as she woke up after the anesthetic, the shoulder was out in the recovery room. So this is when I saw her. It's interesting, the reason I want to put her plain radiographs is that none of the plain radiographs show her shoulder to be dislocated. But we arranged an MRI scan and you can see the shoulder is not dislocated, but it's a sublux. It's just sitting at the edge, but not quite out. And she had had about four attempts. So I saw her about 10 days after initial injury. This was her state. So what would you do at this stage? Deepak? Definitely, we have to evaluate. Uh, we, I think you got an MRI done and uh, what were the findings on an MRI? We could not see any, uh, we could not see any uh, obvious labral tear. The cuff was intact and this is what you see on that. And what about the, uh, the ligaments? The ligaments were fine. Yeah, they were all fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think these are the very one of the very difficult scenario. But since uh, she is there, um, she we, if we take a history and she was absolutely fine, I think then uh, probably there is some capsular laxity associated with it. But definitely, if it is not reducing, we have to plan and probably go inside and see what is happening. Okay, I'm glad you say that because this is what I did. So I went and did an arthroscopy. Uh, I did an EUA and you could sublux the shoulder and inferiorly. It was not multidirectional. It was not going posteriorly. A drive through test was positive. And there was no obvious labral lesion, but I felt that there was maybe a small rent. This is the anterior inferior capsule. I do have all my operations in beat chair position. So viewing through the posterior portal, I thought there was a little rent in the inferior capsule, which was a bit baggy. So I did my standard technique. I did an inferior capsule plication and shift. I put one anchor in because she was only 14, 15. After my one anchor, her drive through was abolished. She seen, I did an EU again, I could not sublux it. So I decided that because she's so young, I will not put more anchors in. And I just left it at one anchor. I kept her in a sling for about four to six weeks time. And then we rehabbed her and she was fine. For 18 months, she did fine. And then she started coming back to our emergency department with further episodes of the shoulder subluxing. So what do you do now? And she has been undergoing muscle training and everything. Yeah, so we, she was doing rehab for those 18 months and everything seemed to be fine. But now she's subluxing, she's now two years so essentially from the initial operation, she's about four years down the line. And now what she's gone in, if, you, if I go back to that Stanmore triangle, so I think she was in a traumatic episode based on, on an atraumatic. So it was type one over type two, but mm. now she has got severe muscle patterning. She can hardly even elevate her arm above 90 degrees. So she's been going intensive face-to-face -face physio for last six months. And now we can barely manage that she can elevate her arm above 90 degrees. 
you moment you stabilize her scapula you lie on her on bed she has got full movements but now she's got severe muscle patterning superimposed on that so what start so the reason to bring this case is that what started with a trivial traumatic injury with the shoulder that was persistently subluxed in somebody who had no previous shoulder problem and i in hindsight i don't know whether i did the right thing by operating on her in the first instance maybe i should have persisted with more physio she's got very my physio tells me that she's got very hyperactive pec major i have tried to botox inject give a botox injection to her pec which seemed to stabilize for a while but it's come out again so the reason to discuss this case is that things are not always straightforward as we think she has got a lot of psychological issues which we have now unraveled so things have not been right from the day one and maybe my first operation was not the right one the question now that i pose to you is would you now her shoulder is still subluxing she has got poor proprioception would you operate on her now no i don't think so i think this is the time these are the patients uh, who come to us and i don't think that they will do well with surgery they will keep on telling you they will keep on going here and there and somebody advises them okay go for surgery we'll do any surgery i think these are the patients we would not like to put a knife again and we will we should try to do some psychological counseling and rehab basically a strengthening only program that's where we are so as i said you know she was probably somewhere here when we just when she dislocated but now she is coming in this area here where she was muscle patterning non structural and she's now come here so it is a, this is what so again this was a different failure but it is again one of my cases which has failed and i thought i'll discuss it with you uh i'll just go to the, the other another this is probably i'll finish after this case although i've got few others but i'll probably just finish after this case because it is not always the patient's fault that they've got a dislocation and that their surgery has failed so this is a 19 year old boy who had recurrent posture instability i know i was to, i was supposed to talk about anterior instability but this was she he was sent to me with query recurrent posture instability he had seen another surgeon in a ho- another hospital who had done an open procedure for his posture instability because he does not do arthroscopic work and he had put in done an open stabilization now if you look at the plain x ray here there are two metal anchors which are very high they are in the upper quadrant of the glenoid here this is a ct scan this anchor is far to medial and when i scoped him you can see i'm viewing through the posterior portal so his anchors are very high but they have missed an under the reason because they did it open they missed out an inferior labral lesion this this labrum is not normal and they also missed an anterior labral lesion which is there so this was a technical error this is a pilot error which has led to the crash here so they have missed an because they did not do proper imaging and they just went based upon the fact that his shoulder he was feeling his shoulder come out posteriorly they opened him through the back they never assessed the rest of the the labrum and they put two anchors which were too high and as you can see and play this video again there is evidence of contral damage because the the, the anchors are too medial the labrum is not healed there is labral pathology inferiorly as well so you can't blame the patient always for the failure so that brings us to the fact that when you are so in this patient you know the anterior lesion was missed the labrum was poor the anchors were very high and very medial and there was contral damage but we mobilized the whole labrum we've done a both anterior and posterior uh, uh, repair we did him in in december you know november last year so i will not tell you whether it's a success or failure because that to quantify or to qualify something as a success or failure less than 2 years after stability surgery is completely naive so i will not say that to you but what i the reason this i brought this case was that it is not always a second trauma the poor surgery poor surgery technique is very important uh, contributor to the failure So do we have time to discuss one last case Herjavan
Yes, sir. We can do that. Okay, so this is an interesting person. So this is a guy who's 34 now. Uh, Aberdeen has got a lot of offshore oil industry. So his job involves abseiling down these sides of offshore rigs. So essentially he's hanging down from ropes, ropes working on these. There are four dislocations before I did an anterior stabilization and ramp massage in 2013. He returned back to work, which was obviously high energy, uh, you know, uh, hanging down these ropes. In 2018, so five years after the first operation, he was in the gym and he was lying on a bench doing some free weights when he felt the weight would just sort of roll off and he suddenly put his arm into abduction extrotation to catch this weight and shoulder dislocated. And this is his x-ray following that. So this is his, and the anch the, this anchor that you see here is a remplissage anchor and I'll show it to you in a second. So that's his CT scan now. There may be a little bit of anterior glenoid bone loss, which wasn't there to start with. This is the anchor in the remplissage, and this is its MR artogram after the remplissage. Obviously, there's a bit of sort of scattered because of the metal anchor, but the posterior capsule remplissage seems to have healed. The, the, the cuff is right into the defect, it's not lifted off, but he's now failed. So the question here is, did he have insignificant, did he have bipolar bone loss, which I tried to fix with the remplissage and maybe I should have done a latrige to start with. The issues now are, there is an anchor in the humeral head, which we can disregard and probably do a latrige. But going back here, this was the initial glenoid bone loss. Would anyone have done uh, a latrige and not a remplissage at this? Or am I just unfortunate that this has dislocated five years after the initial operation? Comments and criticisms from all of you. I think the initial bad procedure was, I think it was all right. I think with this much of bone loss, we definitely will go for a bank card and a remplissage on first stage. But I think he had a significant injury. The uh, what you are telling is, I think uh, the injury was significant to have a re-dislocation again in such case. And again, a heavy worker, second time, I will always look for going for a lethargy now. I totally yeah, agree, I sir. It's still not an inverted pear shape. Though there's anterior glenoid bone loss, but still, uh, I agree with Dr. Deepak that I would have also done the same thing. That's reassuring. Yeah, the answer is simple. You know, we'll do a latrige now, but it, that is not the solution. What I want to try to bring these cases to analyze why the initial operation failed and if anything, we could have done anything better. So in, to bring it all together, I think there is still, in my opinion, an unacceptable failure rate after arthroscopic stabilization in some series, but the causes are multifactorial and we have to pay a lot of attention to evaluation of patient prior to the index operation. Make sure that you've ruled out any underlying ligamentous laxity, any muscle patterning. And when you're confronted with a failed stabilization operation, get all the history, details of previous surgery, patient's medical problems. One thing that I haven't spoken about, which was spoken briefly by somebody else was epilepsy. You know, Have they got any underlying seizures? And then you investigate to identify your soft tissue lesions and your bony defect. And then the man management for each case is tailored to the specific patient. There's not a, a recipe book which you can follow, but if you follow the principles, A, you will reduce your failure rates and B, you'll have a structured approach to address your, uh, the, uh, when you're confronted with a patient with a failed procedure. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. I think you have cleared. Uh, I wanted to ask you one thing, but I think you have already answered that within the presentation only. Go and ask it again. So I wanted to ask uh, whether your procedure of choice for the failed uh, surgeries, failed cases, is still, uh, you have a pre-op decided that this is a arthroscopic revision bank card you should consider in this patient or you would straight away plan for latter J. But I think that is. 
I think the issue there is that if, so if I have done the operation myself and that has failed and there is, but still there is no significant bone loss, then I think then that in that case, I've made a decision that doing a repeat soft tissue procedure is not going to be helpful. However, if the patient comes from somewhere, especially the surgeon I know is maybe not a very good arthroscopist, but they've attempted arthroscopic surgery. And I don't have bone loss documented on my pre-op investigations. Then I will probably try an arthroscopy and evaluate the, the soft tissue. And if they're repairable again, I'll do that. But sometimes you go in and the soft tissue quality is not good. You know, the thing that I tell a lot of my patients is that doing pre-op scans is like internet shopping. You can see uh, what you're getting, but it's only the quality is when the thing comes into your hand. That's when you go and do an arthroscopy, you discover that the labrum of the capsule is poor and you really can't pass any sutures through it or the sutures cut through. There's no point in doing that. If you're the raw material you're dealing with is not good enough, there's no point in doing uh, a soft tissue procedure. Anyone, anyone from the panelists has any other question? Shekhar sir or Deepak Doshi sir? Yes, uh, Dr. Kapil, that uh, case of 19 year old girl which you showed. So do you think that uh, it may have been a case of muscle patterning to start with instead of having a structural problem which because we couldn't see any definite structural problem there? You're right Shekhar. The only, so if I go back and I turn the clock back five years ago, now wisdom of hindsight. So I was presented with a young girl who was doing her gymnastics till the previous week in school and managing okay. Then she has a fall or stumble and her shoulder comes out. Probably in wisdom, I should have maybe tried to find out what the exact mechanism of injury, you know, how bad the injury was. In hindsight, Alarm bell should have been ringing because there was no single x-ray where the shoulder was completely out. It was only subluxing. How come the shoulder was stable when they took her to theater and they could manage to reduce it? But how come the shoulder always subluxed when, as soon as she came out of an anesthetic? So my alarm bell should have been ringing at that time. But you're right. Uh, that's hindsight. But at that time, everything fitted. You know, I had, had a girl whose shoulder was not staying in and I had to do something to help her. So, yeah, that's, that is it. Yeah. I think Raman Agarwal has raised his hand and wants to make a comment or question. I don't know whether we can allow him. Yes, we can. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Raman. Yes, yes we can. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, excellent talks. I missed out on Deepak's talk, but uh, right from Ashish, I've been listening. Fantastic. Uh, just a comment, uh, Kapil. I recently got caught in a posterior instability. It was a 100 kilos wrestler. And uh, it was my clinical diagnosis was a slap or a posterior labral tear. Uh, MRI proved a posterior labral tear, no slap. I went in. I, it was a, absolutely just a posterior labral tear and no nothing, no other pathology. I repaired it. But this patient tells me uh, my shoulder is loose. And now the situation is that I made him do dips in my OPD. He does push-ups. He does dips. Halfway through, excellent negative control. No muscle patterning. And he is my OPD. I sent him for a repeat MR scan at the same center. And now he comes with an intra tendinous tear of the biceps, starting from the anchor, which I never believed because the biceps... I went on to the uh, recordings of the video and everything was pristine, so I don't believe that. And then he says, my shoulder is still loose, and it is only loose when I'm pulling, but not pushing. And if it is a posterior labral injury, and during pushing, he doesn't feel the pain, uh, it's only during pulling, and when the posterior labrum is not supposed to be loaded, and the pain is posterior. Then suddenly I asked him, can you show me how your shoulder is loose? And he demonstrated a voluntary posterior uh, uh, subluxation. A voluntary. I said, why didn't you, sh why didn't you uh, show me this before I operated upon you? And he says, well, sir, I, I could do it. I always knew it. So this posterior instability, MR proven, and posterior voluntary uh, 
instability, but positional, uh, not muscular, not in adduction at 90 degrees abduction, which A and A would say that you can go and repair a Kim's lesion. But I got caught and now I'm, this is my second episode in 10 years that I've got caught on posterior instability. One patient can still not dislocate, but she still feels abnormal. Uh, and she was a woman. So uh, this is a 100 kilo young boy, a wrestler from Haryana. And he, he is also having some problem with the, this uh, muscular control. So I agree. I, I think in posterior instabilities, uh, we need to be really, really cautious. The second thing I would want to say that I don't have much experience of revisions, but in eight cases I have done, one has been the surgeon. I know the surgeon, who the surgeon is, so excellent. And, but in those days, we were not doing ramp research. So I did a arthroscopic bank card repair and a, and a ramp research, and the patient is doing fine. But in all other cases, especially in the Indian scenario, all seven other cases was the inadequate surgery. Fair enough. I think, Raman, your, your wrestler is interesting. Yes. So the, his, his instability is not structural. It is muscular. He has got a voluntary contribution to it. Yes. He, and does, it it was. He, he does it voluntarily. And he needs re-education. His muscles need re-education. It's interesting. When he can do dips and push-outs and yes. everything else, that means when his muscles are engaged, his shoulder is stable. When his yep. muscles are not engaged and he can do it selectively himself, so that yeah. is a problem. So you have, he may have had a structural problem, which you've already addressed, but his muscle control, he needs a good physiotherapist with biofeedback, but more importantly, he needs education that he should not be doing it. Yeah, I mean, I've spent some time, but, and, and you know, it is again the uh, check, check boxes, and I failed to tick that box. I usually ask, can you do it yourself in any case of instability? And I remember I didn't ask him this because looking at him, he was 100 kilos and, and a wrestler and doing dips and all. So I didn't think of that uh, psychological uh, or a voluntary kind of a thing, but I failed to do that. And uh, I think we should always ask this, can you do it? And people are usually able to do that. But excellent, excellent talks. Thank you, Raman, sir. So if we have no more questions, sir, we can uh, conclude the session then. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Kapil, Good sir. interaction. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See you later. Bye. 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 And thank you, Shavati, sir. Hina, you have to unmute first. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Thank you, doctors. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, bye, -bye doctors. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you, all of you, for attending the webinar. Very Thank good you. topic. Be safe and please take care of yourself. Thank you.